Hey everyone, my name is Carrie Northey and I'm a funeral director and embalmer in Michigan. And during this COVID-19 outbreak pandemic that is impacting us globally, I've noticed that we're not focusing much on the front line that is happening within the funeral business. And since that's my area, I wanted to dive in and do some interviews with frontline workers in the funeral business. So I wanted to dive in and interview embalmers and funeral directors who are on one side caring for those that are dying of COVID-19 and of every other cause of death that are also happening right now and what they're experiencing, what they're encountering in terms of personal protective equipment and hospitals and on the removals and just what their experiences are right now. On the other side, I also want to interview the funeral directors who are working with families currently, who are having to enforce their restrictions of how many people can attend a funeral and who are working with the families as they're making some large decisions for themselves to bury their loved ones or cremate their loved ones. So I wanna dive in on this first video. We are going to interview um, some embalmers and get their perspectives on what is happening right now on the front line. I am here guys with Jim Meyer and he is in Michigan with me. Where are you at in Michigan, Jim? Niles, Michigan. Uh, Niles. Closer to Chicago than Detroit. And you are a dual licensed as we are here in Michigan. So you're both yes. a funeral director and an embalmer. So this first conversation, we're going to talk about the embalming side of what kind of you've been encountering over the past few weeks or two to three months. Um, now, have you cared for anybody that has been confirmed with COVID-19? Well, yes. Early, a month ago, had um, uh, uh, two different persons under investigation, the PUI um, nomenclature that they use. Uh, one was a, a patient who was actually in the coronavirus unit at the hospital, mm. so was exposed, but had a negative test. The second one was in a discovered death in a home, had some evidence, but ended up being not coronavirus. And then um, more recently, <clears throat> had a, a home removal, called to a home where death was of a certified COVID-19 patient. Um, and who kind of alerted you? Like the ones from the hospital, did they tell you kind of what was happening when they called you about yes. this? Yes, the, the nurse that called uh, reporting the death told me right up front that it was, uh, that the patient was in the COVID unit in the hospital, but okay. had a negative test. But it still meant that she was totally exposed and you know, two back loads of personal effects were all exposed. These individuals, are they going to be autopsied or are they coming right into your care? No, they're coming right into my care. In fact, you know, from the hospital, um, you know, I went directly to the hospital more. Sometimes I go right to the floor in the hospital. Um, okay. But in this case, they didn't want me entering the COVID unit. Um, the other two were both home removals. So yes, I went directly to the home made the removal. The one that was certified COVID was, um, it was a little unexpected. So the family called 911, ambulance came, tried resuscitation, left. Uh, Sheriff's department was there and the medical examiner's investigator it was the medical examiner's investigator who called us and notified us right up front. So then do they do the test and then you get that information later? Uh, no, and in fact, I had, before I left the house, while I was sitting in the driveway with the stretcher in the car, I called the county health department and, you know, through their computerized, you know, options, um, there was one option for a provider to register a death well, it took me to the state health department. Okay. I talked to the state health department. The state health department indicated that they did not need a test, but gave me a toll-free number to the county health department, which was the medical examiner's office. And the medical examiner, relatively small county, said that he wished to 
reserve all of his COVID tests for live patients. This particular patient, you know, checked like 10 out of 12 boxes on the uh, most likely list. And so the medical examiner did include COVID on the death certificate. So some of this is logical guessing. It's not factual testing done on every deceased is what I'm hearing from different states as well. But it's kind of what it sounds like is they are kind of reserving some of the actual test tests and we're going with, you know, logical. And the people that you've cared for who have had COVID-19, have you noticed differences in their physicality and with the embalming and with the preparation? Just like non-COVID cases, you know, every COVID patient who's involved is going to have, you know, a unique, unique set of circumstances. Um, you know, I've watched several of our colleagues who have done, you know, so, some excellent Facebook preparation and, and what they have done and really appreciated that. One of those, which I really appreciated, said, take everything out of the embalming room that you don't need. Mm -hmm. You don't have to clean it later, which was it's very true. <laughs> you know, and then set out all everything that you're going to need. So you're not opening doors and drawers. Another excellent practice. But one that I, I was more embalming specific said, before you aspirate to inject the lungs and let he was using a blue fluid, I assume he was talking about Dysan, mm -hmm. um, but he was suggesting injecting each of the lungs with a bottle of Dysan and letting it percolate there for 15 minutes before withdrawing anything, which sounded reasonable, sounded like a good practice to me. When I tried that, you know, using a you know, handheld, you know, gravity fed model, right nothing would go in the lungs. And so I'm assuming that the lungs were full of diseased tissue and probably some, you know, fluid because mm -hmm. of the disease. So I couldn't get anything in, but I tried. Yeah. So is there one thing you have consistently done with each of the deceased besides that, that you were just taking one extra level of precaution with to like hopefully contain and hopefully sanitize more and just kind of a one extra level step that you were doing? Well, I am. And, and of course, using the personal protective equipment, you know, mm -hmm. I've been doing this for a long time and I've gotten a little casual about personal protective equipment, but you know, I don't hesitate when I'm told on a removal that there's an infectious agent present to use personal protective equipment. And so, you know, obviously when I went into the morgue, I used hospital supplied personal protective equipment. Um, but when I go into a house where I know that it's a COVID situation, um, before I go in the house, I, I will go to the door, greet the family through the door and tell them what I'm going to do mm. and go out and put on the, 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 real thin blue plastic apron, you know, that goes from neck clear down to my ankles mm -hmm. with thumb holes, you know, to hold onto the sleeve while you put the gloves on over it and a mask and of course a mask on the remains, which is really important to do and foot covers. And that's what I'll wear in front of the family in the house. And they appreciate that. And they understand that we have to do that. And, um, you know, again, out here in the rural areas and working in front of families, I rarely put a human remains in a pouch in front of the family. Mm -hmm. but the families understand that we have to do this, and they all are accepting of this. And um, you know, then as soon as I get out of the house, I collect all that personal protective equipment. You know, the whole neighborhood and people driving by the street don't need to see that going out in front of their house. I mean. Medical examiner was parked crosswise in the driveway, so nobody could come in. Nice. But um, anyway, so you know, going through the special doffing mechanism, everything goes inside out, so it's containing all the exposure inside of the pieces. And I typically include that inside of the cod. It's a simple and easy way to 
remove that image as we go out to the car. Nice. Now, are you finding a shortage of PPE right now and getting the equipment and things that you need to do what you're doing? Well, it is a little bit of a challenge and, and really appreciate, um, with all due respect to all the different companies, we do a lot of uh, trade with Tom Beist at Dodge. Mm. And he's been great. Like every other day, I get an email about new things that he has available. Really appreciating that. Um, Steve Wickens owns a business and went out on, you know, on the internet and just today we got a box of 100 KN95 masks. Okay. Just great and a really nice piece. It's so good to have those. Um, I had actually gotten to my last N95 mask when I did that embalming. So I took it home, put it upside down, upside down on a cool mist vapor with hydrogen peroxide in it mm. and rejuvenated the mass through that method wow. for two hours. That seems to be an accepted method to rejuvenate N95 mass. That's good. That's people I'm talking to are, I keep saying we're MacGyvering our way through this because we're having to come up with things to do, come up with new, you know, uh, unique things that we just have never done. That's we've seen people with garbage bags and, all sorts of, you know, duct tape, whatever, just to protect themselves if they're running out. And I can't imagine in the epicenters what they're having to do with the shortage of PPE and reuse of things. And we know that nitrile gloves break down over time as we're embalming. And, you know, after enough exposure during, you know, embalmings, we have to switch them out because they get sticky and they get kind of funny and, and stuff. So having to wear one pair of gloves all day, you're definitely you know, breaking them down to a point that I would be a little nervous, I think. Well, again, because I've gotten a little casual about embalming, you know, just with okay. aprons and masks. And, and again, in our removal vehicles, we've had for you know, years and years uh, isolation kits. And fortunately, I've only had to use them once in a while, but we have them. In our, so that's what I actually pulled out the night that I did the embalming for the known COVID patient and um, you know fortunately everything was still fresh enough that it worked well really interesting again because I'm not practicing it was feeling a little claustrophobic when I put it all on because I did the full Tyvek suit mm -hmm. um, put put on you know the first pair of gloves I taped to the outside of the tie event, which was a practice that we learned when we took Ebola training. Mm -hmm. and, um, then a second pair of gloves, the N95 mask. I've got a heavy multi-use face shield, you know, the kind that you can flip up and it's got a band around your head. And I mount my, you know, handy band headlight on that, which helps <laughs> you know, find vessels and things like that. And we have, here at the funeral home, we have uh, medical grade crocs to use in the embalming room, which is just okay. a wonderful uh, help and they're very comfortable and of course easy to clean. But when I first put that on, and it's been so long since I've done that, I felt a little claustrophobic, you know, hyperventilating a little bit inside that mask, kind of sit down and just sounds weird, but to take a deep, long breath to overcome the hyperventilating. And felt remarkably lonely all by myself and all that equipment. How sweaty were you when you had to take all that off is the question. Oh, it, it was remarkable. You know, I took, it was, I wore it a little bit longer than usual because I wore it clear through a fairly thorough cleanup of the embalming room when I was done. And so it was a little bit, it ended up being close to four hours. Oh, goodness. And, um, you know, I had just, for my wife's peace of mind, I had taken a picture of myself in a mirror in the full suit so she knew I was being careful. And so when I took it all off, I took a, the same picture and it was just that picture that you see on the news all the time of nurses and doctors with the ring around the muzzle from that mask. But more importantly, it's, it's the expression. And I realized later when I looked at it, one of the first thing my wife said, she was, 
more upset about my expression than about the ring around my face. But yes, my shirt was all dark with sweat from being inside the time. You know, and, and one of the other things that's happening, I think in every essential vocation, nurses and everybody else, is you know the NFDA asked us if we're willing to go into hotspots. Yeah. And they reported the other day that, you know, six, they had a list of 600, you know, and, and I wrote to them, I said, you know, that's more than just a number, that's 600 of us who are willing to, you know, not to be overly dramatic, but go into harm's way and risk our health and even our lives. And then it's 600 spouses who have agreed to let that happen and accept the possibility of some separation when we need mm -hmm. each other the most. And it's 600 employers that have agreed to do that, you know, and small town employers, they're, you know, agreeing to give up half of their workforce. Well, thank you for joining me chatting about the embalming side of, of what we're doing. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Sure. Thanks. Hey, everyone. We are here with Christy Keen, and she is a licensed funeral director and embalmer. So, Christy, tell us where you're at in the country. Um, I'm in Solana, Tennessee, which is um, Middle Tennessee. We're on the Cumberland Plateau. We're about 100 miles north east of Cookville, or of Nashville, rather. Okay. And you're, I mean, you're a small community, um, very kind of small town feel like you were saying 7,800 people only in your county. So it's kind of a little smaller. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, you, we're a, a call volume of about 68 calls average. Okay. Really. okay. So have you had much exposure at this point to COVID-19 in your area? Kind of what is it, what's going on with you and exposure to um, the virus at this time? Well, we've had limited exposure. Um, there's there's been a couple cases to come through, but um, countywide the numbers are staying very low at four. Our bordering counties um, are more. Putnam County, which is Cookville, just uh, 30 miles from us, is at 92. So statewide, it's um, the confirmed cases are 6,262. So okay, with, with 141 deaths. So what has been your experience when you have handled those that have a diagnosis with COVID-19? Are you finding that out from the hospital, from the family, from a coroner or medical examiner? That's certificates. Okay, so you're not finding out till much After that. down the road. Yes, yes. Um, most instances we have been able to make a determination just by the removal itself because of the precautions that are being taken, um, the specific area of the hospital that the patient has been in, and you know, because we, we are still required to go onto the floor where the, where the patient actually is rather than morgues where some of the larger areas require you to go. So. Okay. Um, so when you're working with these deceased, I mean, you're having to just take universal precautions essentially all the time that all the time. right now, what are you doing more so on removals and handling the deceased as a staff to protect yourselves right now? Well, um, I've always used um, extreme universal precautions. It was just instilled in me from the beginning that all bodies should be treated as if they're contagious. So I've just had to vamp that up a bit. Um, for the removal, in the event that we do go to the morgue, then we don't open the bag. Um, we um, disinfect the outside of the bag. We're double gloving. We've got our mask on, shoe covers, everything that we can wear you know, without taking away from the fact that we are who we are, we're funeral professionals, and you know, we 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 don't want to diminish that while we're doing it. Um, and then, as far as on the floor to to or a home removal, we're disinfecting um, eyes, nose, mouth. I'm using web roll soaked in disc spray to cover the face, and then I, you know, I'm trying to do it with as allowing as much dignity to be maintained, you know, but. Which, which is hard because that is not a standard practice that when we'd go in a home, we would 
spray down, you know, your mom right in front of you or in the other room. So that's definitely maybe a newer step that a lot of funeral directors, I think, are taking just because the expelling of air when, as we're moving the body or anything that could be highly contagious to us. Right, right. Well, I've, um, I've followed the lead of a few of my mentors, and it was suggested to use um, a small um, bottle, it's like a squirt bottle that's discreet, you know, so you can kind of palm it and pour rather than spray and you just have to find ways that work for you that you can, you know, not be, not add insult to injury, you know, yeah. and, and exactly the, most cases, in the moment. Yeah, in most of these cases, the family isn't around anyway because right. of the restrictions at the hospital. So, you know, and then the healthcare professionals, it's new. I've had them to say, well, I've never seen anybody do that before. Well, you probably should be seeing people do that now. So, yeah. Now, are you doing prep work on the deceased, the ones that you've cared for that have had COVID confirmed, or have they been cremations or? No prep work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you noticed anything, any glaring differences with the preparation? I know everybody is different. Every deceased is different. But yeah. has there been, been anything that has kind of stood out to you as maybe being different? Yes. Um, for me, and for the two cases that I've had, they've been very similar in the fact that there has been a lot to, um, um, from, to expel through aspiration of the, the lungs especially and there's been um some purge you know that's of um i don't know it's an it's not a it's just of a different color and texture it's just not your normal you know lung or you know brain you know it's just not your normal purge it's, you know with okay. your typical pneumonia cases it's an, a a thicker wider yellow color and this is an it's not really thin but it's not as thick as the typical pneumonia and it seems to be an orangey it's an orangey color hmm. yeah yeah it's interesting and it lasts forever I've, I've it's like i don't think i'm ever gonna be able to stop aspirating and, and you know in, in both the cases um one embalmed beautifully the other one embalmed thoroughly but you know we had our challenges but those would have been there no matter i think just the conditions of the body itself without COVID being consideration. Well, and I think a lot of people, there are people who had a pre-existing condition which mm -hmm. would have made a challenge regardless, you know, where it, whether diabetes or some type of a heart condition where their circulatory system was faulty or challenged previously. And then this on top of you know, that is definitely going to change the body regardless. Um, right, not, right. Just the, not just the COVID-19. Um, right. So what, how are you doing with PPE? I know that's a big conversation within the medical community, but yet within the funeral community, I know a lot of people in different areas, especially I think the hotspot areas, but are struggling to get the appropriate PPE or having to reuse or having to put together all sorts of, you know, wacky outfits to feel protected right now. So how are you doing where you're at? Well, we've, we've been pretty fortunate because our local hardware store, right off the bat, I went and got the, all the goggles they had, or well, I left a few because the local hospital and went after me and got the rest. Um, okay. I was going to, I didn't want to be selfish about it. So I got half of what they wanted or what they had. And then I went back to get more and they're like, oh, the local hospital in adjoining county, they, they grabbed those. But then we, um, they had Tybex suits um, in storage upstairs. So we, we took, we took all of those. So we've, you know, got that barrier and that's, that's really good. So um, nice. as far as, as far as mask, we, you know, we've, we've done very well so far. We've not used what we have. Um, but we've ad libbed and it was recommended on an, a zoom conference that I had with some fellow bombers that, um, a three M air filter for your house can be used. And so we, we gathered some of those, cut them to size, had masks made that we can insert those for, for hard times. So we're ready. 
How about body bags? How are you doing with, um, you know, pouches? That's another one that I've heard people are getting in dire need of shortage on. Yeah, we, we don't have any. Okay. Yeah, they're not any. We do have access. Um, our local EMS has offered, you know, to, to help us with that. But as far as having the ability to, to just gather them, and we didn't use them prior to, so that's, that's one thing, you know, that we yeah, didn't, if you didn't have, have them before. Right, right. right. When we're, right. we're still in an area where um, on home removals, most people, they don't want their family member's face covered, you yeah. know. So, you know, we're, we're still in a, and we're, we're still in a traditional funeral area. So this has been quite tough. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing about the prep side of everything with me. And we will be talking to Christy again in the funeral video um, coming in a few days. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And a huge thank you to all the embalmers for taking some time to be interviewed by me and sharing their stories with me during this time that they're working on the front line and caring for all of the dead during this virus outbreak. I'm so thankful for them. I want to close out the video with sharing faces of the frontline workers who are caring for all those who are dying during this time. Thank you all.